Okay folks, welcome back. It's time to get started with the 6mm ARC. This is a new cartridge from Hornady, designed to shoot heavy 6mm bullets out of the AR-15 platform. You might be surprised that I would tackle another one of these, because we didn't have much luck with the 22 Nosler, we didn't have much luck with the 224 Valkyrie, so I really wasn't planning to take on any new AR-15 cartridges anytime soon, but this one, man, it really piqued my interest, because the alternative chambering for the AR-15 that I've had the most luck with is 6.5 Grendel. And while this, the 6 arc isn't like a, you know, a 6 millimeter version of the 6.5 Grendel, it's got a lot in common, which we'll look at closer here in just a second. I've got a whole bunch of different cartridges to show you and compare the 6 millimeter arc with, which I'll tell you what, let's do that first. Okay, so these three cartridges are the 6.5 Grendel, the 6mm ARC, and the 6PPC. Now the 6PPC is the king of bench rest shooting, 100 yard bench rest, or I guess I should say short range bench rest. I think they shoot 200 yards as well. You might have seen me do some videos on 6PPC with my grandfather's old bench rest rifle, just an absolutely ridiculously accurate cartridge. So the 6mm ARC, little bit longer body of the case, a little bit more taper it looks like, and a little bit shorter neck. If you look at the, the brass overall length, it's pretty close, so this guy's got a little bit more neck to it. And if we look at it compared to the 6.5 Grendel, that shoulder is a little bit lower. Brass length is a little bit shorter. And I'm not sure if it's just because this is the shinier piece, but it looks like uh, diameter might be a little bit smaller below the shoulder. I'll tell you what, let me measure that real quick. I'm thinking that might just be an optical illusion. Yep, that's exactly what it is. The six arc only measures about two thousandths of an inch smaller than the other two, right below the shoulder. So, never mind. So they're all pretty close. These all share the same parent case, which is the 220 Russian. Now that's a little bit bigger than this guy right here is a 6.8 SPC. So you can see it's a good bit smaller. And then actually, there's a piece of just plain old 223 there. So these three different case head sizes are going to use different bolts. And we're going to talk quite a bit more about the bolts here in just a minute, because it might be a good reason for you to avoid this six millimeter arc cartridge. So we're going to test the case capacities here in a minute, by, but I expect it to fall within the range of the Grendel and the PPC. So let's move on to a different comparison. So with this comparison, it might be hard to explain what the hell I'm getting at here, but these are six different cartridges made for the AR-15. And if you remember, we're always, we're limited by that 2.260 inch overall length, which is our magazine length, right? So on the left here are some 22 caliber stuff. So you got good old standard 223. This is the 22 Nosler, and this is the 224 Valkyrie. So in the two on the left, the, this is the 77 grain Sierra Match King, which is a perfect heavy bullet for those two cartridges. If you go much heavier, then you run into problems where you need to exceed that 2.260 inch overall length to fit the bullet in there. Now the 224 Valkyrie came out, this is the 90 grain Sierra Match King, and it was designed to fit that bullet perfectly. Now the 224 Valkyrie also uses a different bolt, right? The two on the left use the standard 223 bolt, and the 224 Valkyrie uses the 6.8 SPC bolt, the middle size bolt. And the 22 Nosler got around using a bigger bolt by having a rebated uh, rim. Yeah, there you go. You can see the rim is smaller than the rest of the cartridge. This was a terrible decision on their part because that was the biggest problem with the 22 Nosler is we couldn't keep brass together for reloading, right? The case heads were getting chewed up. That's a whole lot of pressure on that tiny little case head. And then with our testing of the 224 Valkyrie, we had a really tough time with primer pockets getting loose. So we could only get one or two firings on brass before we started having issues. It's been a little while since I've checked in on the communities for those cartridges to kind of see if there's been any new information, new brass available, something like that, that helped the situation. I've been out of the loop a little bit, but with the 22 Nosler, we did switch to the larger bolt, got rid of the rebated uh, rim. We used this stuff right here, which is six millimeter Hager brass, and we formed it to fit in the 22 Nosler chamber, and that gave us the larger case head to work with, and that kind of fixes the, the issues with that cartridge. But I'm not really sure where things stand with the Valkyrie. Okay, I kind of got off on a tangent there. Over here on the right, 
This is a piece of 6.8 SPC brass. I, I don't have any bullets or I'd seat one in there so you could see what's going on, but yeah, that's a 6.8 SPC. The one to the right is a cartridge we tested last year, also a six millimeter cartridge for the AR-15, the six millimeter WOA from White Oak Armament, which to oversimplify matters is a 6.8 SPC neck down to six millimeter and the shoulder angle was changed to a 30, uh, 30 degree shoulder. I think the SPC is like 23 degrees. I, yeah, I think whatever, something like that. But the shoulder angle was increased. Now, if we look on the right, this is our six millimeter arc. You can see a much lower shoulder and a whole lot more room for a big heavy bullet. So this is a, this is a 105 grain Hornady bullet in there. This is a piece of factory ammo for the six arc. And this here is an 85 grain bullet, which when we were testing the six millimeter WOA, we focused on that 85 to 95 grain bullet range. We did try out the 107 grain Sierra Match King, and I think we did the uh, 103 grain Hornady ELDX, but it was just, you know, the bullets are too dang long for this cartridge. We were either have to, we either, either had to shoot them at longer than magazine length, or we had to seat them so low that the O drive of the bullet was below the case mouth. So the sweet spot, as far as weight here, maybe around 90, 85 to 95 grains. We, we had a lot of luck with the 90 grain Sierra Game Changer in the six millimeter WOA, but with the six millimeter arc, we've just, we've got a whole lot more room to work with really heavy bullets. And that's what this cartridge is all about. The factory ammo they've got available right now uh, is the 105 grain Boattail Hollow Point. They've got a, uh, that's like their, what they call their Hornady Black, which is what this is. Their Hornady Match ammo uses the 108 grain ELD Match. So big heavy bullets are what this cartridge is all about. So if you are primarily looking at this to shoot light bullets for varmint hunting, it might not be the best choice for you. All right, I think that covers it for the most part. There's our, there's our Grendel. That's really my hope. I hope we have as much success with this cartridge as we've had with the 6.5 Grendel. And if we do, then this six millimeter arc might be a pretty darn good option for folks who want to mess around at long range and also want something they can deer hunt with for reasonably short range, you know? Like we're, we're gonna be limited by velocity. That's, a, that's the biggest frustration sometimes with the 6.5 Grendel as well. Like, man, if we just had a couple hundred more feet per second, performance would be a whole lot better, but it is what it is, you know? We're working with a restricted platform. We only have so much magazine length to work with, and there's just only so much velocity we're gonna get. But I imagine like the 6 arcs probably gonna be a great whitetail deer cartridge for three, four hundred yards or so, you know, maybe 500. That's the same with the 6.5 Grendel. And the thing is, that's more than I need. Hey guys, this is me from the future. I was editing this video and realized I forgot to talk about case capacity. The easiest way that I know of to measure case capacity is to, to take a weight of an empty piece of brass, either record that weight or tear your scale, and then fill the case full of water, and then take another weight and calculate how many grains of water the case held. So I compared four of the cartridges we talked about, and these numbers I got were from fired brass, because that's what I had handy. And this number will change a bit depending on, you know, the, the brand of brass you're using. And if I was using resized brass, the numbers would be just a little bit smaller, right? So these numbers aren't, you know, absolute, a little bit of wiggle room here, but th these are the numbers I came up with. The six millimeter WOA, held 34.6, the 6 PPC held 33.6, the 6 ARC held 34.0, and the 6.5 Grendel held 36.1. Nothing too surprising here. I was surprised that the PPC was that close to the ARC, you know, only found four tenths of a grain of water difference between the two. But if you remember, like the brass length is pretty much the same between the two cases. So 6 PPC gets a little more extra water in there just because of that long neck, while the length of the neck doesn't necessarily give you more room for powder in the context we're talking about, right? But even still, we would only be talking about a couple tenths, you know? I was also curious to see how close the 6 WOA and the 6 ARC would be. You know, the 6 WOA is so much longer, the body of the case is so much longer, but it's got that smaller 6.8 SPC sized case body. 
So you can see how quickly the arc kind of catches up pretty close to it, just with that larger bodied parent case. So that's about it. Just wanted to kind of splice this in here where it belongs in the video. All right, did I make that shot bright enough? Can you see the faces of these bolts? Well, what we got here, these two on the right are my 6.5 Grendel bolts. This is a 6.8 SPC bolt. And then this one over here is a standard 223 bolt. Now, if we take out the one in the middle, as far as size goes, I really should have grabbed a 223 bolt that had some wear on it. This is a new one and it's kind of hard to see. Hold on one second, let me go grab a different one. Okay, that makes it easier to see. The spot to focus on is the thickness right around here. Look how thin that area is on a Grendel bolt. And if we bring the 6.8 SPC bolt back into the mix, you'll see that it's kind of in the middle. So nice and beefy, a little bit thinner, and then we're starting to get like alarmingly thin. Okay, then if we tilt them up and have a look at where, you know, where the lugs are on the bolt, you can imagine how much weaker this must be with so little material behind it when compared to like the 223 with lots of meat behind it. So this has always been one of the biggest worries when it comes to the 6.5 Grendel. And these same concerns are gonna carry forward to the six millimeter arc. Now this is the bolt I'll be using in these videos. This is a Maxim bolt. Even back to when I first uh, started building my first 6.5 Grendel, I always heard good things about Maxim bolts. So whenever I decided to get one, I got a Maxim. But my first Grendel barrel came with a bolt. It was a barrel from Brownells made by Saturn, I think. So I have no idea who made this bolt. It came with it. And if you go back to my first couple of 6.5 Grendel videos years back, we had big problems with this stupid bolt, but they had to do with the extractor. So way back then we ended up having to take a Dremel tool and round off some of the edges on the extractor to get it to reliably extract cartridges. So I was always a little cautious of this bolt. I figured it would be a piece of crap if they couldn't figure out how to get it to extract then it was only a matter of time before I ended up shearing off uh, some lugs. And over time, I've kept an eye on the lugs. Like I, I still don't see any problems with this bolt. It still works just fine. So this is the one I'm currently running in my, uh, in my 6.5 Grendel. And then we're gonna use the Maxim bolt here in the six millimeter arc. So if you're building a six millimeter arc and you're reading about potential bolt problems and you're a little bit freaked out, then maybe go with a Maxim bolt or a JP. So the Maxim is about is about 75 bucks and a JP, yeah, a JP enhanced bolt is about 140 bucks. So JP bolts are very expensive, but most people seem to think they're good. Now there is a fourth type of bolt and that's the 762 by 39 bolt, which the case head diameter is the same as the Grendel bolt but the Grendel bolt is a little bit deeper. Yeah, the Grendel is actually about 12 thousandths deeper. Yep, just measuring the bolt face depth. So the Grendel bolt, you'll also sometimes see it called a type two bolt. As far as I know, this is the one we're supposed to be using with the six millimeter arc. And in, anywhere you go, if you just buy a bolt that's, that's labeled a Grendel bolt, it's gonna be the Grendel bolt face depth of the, you know, Sammy spec Grendel. Now, if you decide the six millimeter arc isn't what you want and you're gonna go off into wildcat land, which there are a lot, like the six millimeter AR, the six millimeter Grendel, the 243 LBC, like I think all of those are based on the same parent cartridge, but some of them may end up using the type one bolt with the shallower deep face or shallower uh, bolt face. I think the LBC series of stuff uses the, the shallower, 762 by 39 bolt face. All right, that's, yeah, I don't know. Don't take my word on any of that, but just be careful. Now you might be saying to yourself, dude, we're here for reloading info. We don't really care about bolts. What the hell are you talking about bolts for? Well, I wanted to show you the difference because there's something I wanna show you. There's something I wanna to read to you. So let's jump over to the computer. Okay, so I've got something I wanna read for you here. It's a blog post on the White Oak Armament website. 
If you're not familiar with White Oak Armament, we're big fans of them here. Bought several of their barrels. We actually worked with them on that six millimeter WOA project I was talking about from last year. Well, they posted this blog post, which is kind of just their thoughts on the six millimeter arc. And just to provide some background, they've never offered 6.5 Grendel barrels. And from asking them about that in the past, I got the feeling that it, it really had to do with the bolts and you know concerns about durability. And another thing I should mention is White Oak is all about building uppers and barrels and stuff for high power competition. So just keep that in mind. They're very focused on stuff for use in competition. So let's go ahead and read. We have been getting a lot of calls and emails in the last week or so asking if we are chambering barrels for the new Hornady 6mm arc. While we have not yet made a decision about 6mm arc, we are quite familiar with the various 6mm cartridges that are designed to work through the AR-15 platform and the limitations and advantages of most of them. The idea of 6mm cartridge with a case capacity in the 27 to 30 grain range out of the AR-15 is a great idea with a ton of versatility. You can shoot anything from a light varmint bullet at well over 3,400 feet per second for varmints to a long 108 or 107 at 2,700 for long range target work or an 87 to 95 for an effective hunting round with the accuracy and terminal performance to take medium game out to 500 yards. Sorry, but while you may be able to hit one at much longer ranges, you will not have the terminal velocity for effective bullet performance and good kills past that range. Many such cartridges have been developed, most based on either the 6.8 SPC case with its .420 head diameter or the 762 by 39 case with a .440 head size. Hornady chose to go with the larger 440 head size for the six millimeter arc cartridge. We have built many rifles in various Wildcat cartridges on the 440 head size case, as well as the 264 LBC. What we found is that they just do not give the reliability and longevity that we as target shooters need at the pressures that we typically shoot. In the crucible of com competitive high power shooting, where we tend to tip the powder can to the limit of what the case will hold, they just did not hold up. Other gunsmiths built them and had success with them, but lug setback and breakage was at a level that I was personally uncomfortable with. At that time, I made the decision to not chamber for the 440 head size cartridges. In addition, I feel there are other cartridges that are better for the specific demands of the across the course match rifle shooter. Hornady confirmed my feelings by limiting the new cartridge to 52,000 PSI max pressure. At that pressure, bolts and barrel extension should last a long time. Start tipping the powder can and all bets are off. If you are one to add powder until primers fall out, then back off slightly. Don't expect to keep all the lugs on your bolt if you shoot a lot. At this time, our plan is to get a reamer and make up a few barrels to torture test them. I will have to be convinced that the reliability and longevity are there before we start selling them to our customers. We will keep you informed. So that's why I've spent a few minutes talking about bolts there. And if we go to the uh, Sammy drawing for the six millimeter arc, which by the way, I don't think I mentioned it earlier. That's a big reason why I'll take a chance on this cartridge while some of the other six millimeter Wildcats, which I don't know, maybe they're better. I don't know, I haven't tried them. But this one is a Sammy cartridge, which means if it's, if it's successful, then gun makers are gonna make guns and ammo makers are gonna make ammo. And it won't just be limited to those with the, with the desire to get into a Wildcat. But one thing White Oak mentioned was this, yeah, maximum average pressure. 52,000 PSI. It's the same as the 6.5 Grendel. And back when I first built, you know, my first Grendel, man, we did some dumb stuff. There wasn't a whole lot of load data published at that point, And we were just kind of experimenting and trying different things. And, you know, as reloaders, a lot of times pressure signs are what you have to go by when you're loading with, with no published load data. And we shot some really hot rounds, way, way, way too hot. We tore up a whole lot of brass. I mean, luckily I, I still have not had a bolt failure of any sort. You saw my two bolts. Those are the only bolts I've ever shot in the Grendel. And both of them are in pretty good shape still. So they survived some pretty dumb stuff, which makes me feel more confident going into this six millimeter arc. But as this project moves forward, you know, we will always be keeping in mind that 52,000 PSI limit. And it just is what it is. Like since more published data has come out for the Grendel over the years, you know, I've started trying to stick somewhat close to it, 
and my brass life is a whole lot better, <laughs> and the groups are good, and, and the gun runs well, and, and all of that stuff. So we're going to see what we can get out of this 6mm arc, but I'm not going to push it like an idiot very often. Okay, we, we might push it like an idiot a few times, but we're not going to consistently, constantly push it like an idiot. So Hornady has released some load data. Just this one sheet, as far as I know, is all we've got to work with so far. And it is for the 108 and 110 grain bullets. But there's an interesting little note here. It says, this six millimeter arc reloading data is intended for use in gas guns and kept to a maximum pressure of 52,000 PSI. Do not exceed the maximum charges. Separate data will be provided for bolt action firearms. Pretty interesting. So they're telling us, okay, you know, the cartridge can handle it, but your gun can't. Now, if we look down here, these velocities are really lame, like kind of slow, right? They got up to 2575 with CFE 223 and lever evolution, but most of these others are 2400 to 2500. Well, I already shot some of the 105 grain factory ammo through my gun. We're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes, but we were seeing muzzle velocities right around 2640. Now that's a little bit lighter bullet, right? Three to five grains lighter than these two here, but I mean, is three grains lighter bullet going to give us an additional 150 feet per second? I, I don't think so. Or at least 65 feet per second when it comes to CFE 223 and lever evolution. I don't know. I mean, that's why we're going to have to test. Now, the cool thing though is, for at least for our specific situation, is their test barrel is an 18 inch barrel. A Noveski 18 inch, which is good. And their test twist is a one and seven and a half twist, which is the same twist that I got. So it's good to have a baseline here. The powder list is excellent. Like these are some of our very favorite powders. Every powder that is on the list, which we'll talk about more in more detail here in just a few minutes. The only one I don't have on hand, like in, you know, in my stockpile is Normo 202. So all of the other powders I've got, we'll be able to test as many as we need to find something that works for us. And really happy to see some slower options here like Power Pro 2000 MR. Yeah, there it is, Power Pro 2000 MR. And we've got other options, powders that aren't on the list that are kind of in that burn speed range that we'll probably be giving a try. Holy crap, can we start reloading yet? We're almost there. So I just wanted to walk you through the upper really quick. I do have an Odinworks bolt carrier group that I'm using and as we already mentioned, the Maxim bolt. So that's the uh, bolt carrier group set up. The barrel is an Odinworks, 18 inch, one and 7.5 twist. The handguard is an Odinworks Rune, 15.2 inch. The upper is a standard aero precision upper. So this is just their standard what, M4, not their M4E1, like some of the other aero precision uppers we've got. This is just a standard, I guess, mil spec upper receiver. So, you know, nothing nothing too fancy here. I did, uh, I, I went with Odinworks for a couple reasons. Our 22 Nosler barrel was an Odinworks and it shot really well, still does. But up to this point, I still haven't shot that cartridge enough to really give it a good workout. So I wanted to go with it here in the six millimeter arc just to kind of give them another chance. Like I mentioned, this is an 18 inch barrel. And if you notice the gas block sticking out in front of this 15.2 inch hand guard, this has an extra long gas system. This was another big selling point for me because I like to shoot suppressed most of the time. And I thought the extra, uh, the extra long gas system would pair nicely with a suppressor. So the Odinworks barrels, I think most of them come with this, uh, they call it a tunable gas block. They also sell what they call an adjustable gas block that I, I guess is a little bit easier to adjust. This is adjustable, but it's a pain in the butt to adjust. Yep, one of the holes here in the front, you got like an adjustment screw plus a lock screw that goes and just locks down right on top of it. So it's not one that you really want to play around with too much. We have already been on the range with this. I put uh, 80 rounds of factory ammo through it and we had the, we had the gas block adjusted really quickly and it was shooting and cycling pretty darn well, both with and without the suppressor. So that's pretty much it. This scope is going to stay on this guy for a while. It's a Vortex Viper HS, 6 to 24 by 50. And this base, uh, I think it is, yeah, this one is an AR Stoner. This is the first time I've tried one of these AR Stoner cantilever bases. So we'll see how it goes. We've got other scopes in more proven mounts if 
you know, if the gun won't shoot, then we'll throw a different scope on it and find one that will, or at least rule out the scope as a possible problem. Well, like I mentioned, so a couple things that we learned on the range trip. I'm not going to include any of the footage in this video because I had camera problems, recording problems, and the footage is garbage. You might have seen it. I actually live streamed it on Twitch and I uploaded the live stream here to the YouTube channel. So if you watch that, you know kind of what happened with the video footage. It's garbage. But we did run into a couple different issues. The biggest one that we ran into is, so this is the ammo, this is the only ammo I could find. And we just need brass, right? So I bought five boxes of this stuff. This is the Hornady Black 105 grain Boto Hollow Point. And the problem we ran into, which other people have reported the exact same problem, is that whenever you chamber one of these factory rounds, it actually jams into the lands and you can't eject it. Like it, it, it seems to be pretty darn close, which we're gonna test like uh, maximum overall length with this exact same bullet, the 105 grain Boatel hollow point. Yep, got a box of them right here. So we're gonna look and see exactly when these hit the lands and just how far this factory ammo is jamming into the lands. See, I ended up getting one stuck and then I was trying to get it out and then I couldn't get it back into battery. I ended up having to pound it out from the muzzle end with a cleaning rod. It came out easy. Like I said, the bullets aren't like sticking in there like crazy, but it's enough that, you know, the case pulled out of uh, the bullet pulled out of the case, powder went everywhere and it's a big mess. Now, the other problem, I've been out of things for a while now, folks. I haven't made a video in forever and I just really haven't been following what the hell is going on. So I'm sure this has been talked about. I think somebody in the live stream mentioned that it was early lots of this uh, ammo that were having issues. So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll look at them closer here in just a few minutes. And like I said, we'll, we'll play around with that 105 grainer and all of the others and see what sort of overall lengths we should be shooting because these are a little bit too long. That was really the main problem. Otherwise, the gun ran fantastic. Most of our groups were decent. They were you know, a little over an inch. We kind of had some flyers and some crazy stuff, which I guess we could review the targets on the shot marker. Yeah, let's do that. Let's jump back to the computer and I'll show you the targets on shot marker. Okay, so here's our shot marker window. Let's uh, go up here to our previous targets. So the very first group, this one right here, was terrible. It was a three and a half inch group. Well, as it turned out, my suppressor was loose. So this was a completely worthless uh, group. So let's close it, let's go to our second group. And that was much better. So we had five shots that went into 1.15 inches. If we hide the fifth real quick, just to, you know, that's the one that's out of the main group. Yep, the best four went into 0.67 inches. That's pretty good shooting. So let's close that one and go to our third group. There we go, five shots into 1.34 inches. I guess I could zoom in a little bit. There we go. Yep, yep, nope. There we go. So four of them good, and then one that was out just a little bit. But still, you know, for factory ammo, that's not terrible at all. Yep, let's not save that change. Then this next one is a 17-shot group. That was 2.52 inches. Let's hide this one little guy that went way the heck out. So 16 shots into an inch and a half. You know, that's, that's not bad for factory ammo. And let's see... Here's a 20 shot group. <laughs> Things opened up a little bit. We did do some rapid fire shooting, like I was loading up 10 rounds and shooting them as fast as we could. By this point, it was just a matter of dumping rounds to get the brass. So once we kind of had an idea of how this stuff was grouping, a lot of this was just messing around, to be quite honest with you. And, you know, still 20 rounds of screwing around. It was a little over two inches. I, I'm, I'm cool with that. And let's see, there's a five shot group in 1.02 inches. And then the last group, got some hidden shots here. I don't remember why I hid those. Let's unhide those. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, I think that's all of them. Uh, hang on, this doesn't even have a box around it. There it is, 1.86 inches. That was 15 shots. So, you know, you kind of get the idea. A little over an inch. It was kind of trying to group, but then again, it was factory ammo that was jamming into the lands, and plus we were screwing around a little bit not taking it all that seriously. Now, velocities were pretty good. Like on the, the lab radar chronograph, I had recorded six different strings. The lowest was 2631, the highest was 2647. All of the standard deviations were in the teens, except for the first one, which was 22.7. So 
let's call it 2640 and then you know like the yeah that standard deviation of maybe an average of about 15. not exactly great stuff but that's about what i would expect from some factory ammo and that velocity of 2640 like we already mentioned earlier is going to be hard to duplicate if the uh yeah let's go back over to the load data here yeah so these these velocity numbers are a good bit lower than 2640 so we might have our work cut out for us okay so i think we can finally get started with some freaking reloading here as i mentioned the whole point of getting all that factory ammo was getting brass because brass just hasn't hit the market i'm still waiting on brass that i ordered at the same time that i ordered the barrel which was months ago so i guess all of hornady's brass is going into making factory ammo so there's a nice shiny box of 50 and here is 29 more we're missing that one because that's the one where the bullet jammed into the lands and we had to yank it out of there yep this is actually that guy right here and still got the primer in it but we're going to find a use for that guy here in just a second as you might be able to tell i've already wet tumbled these so i used a universal decapping die to pop out all of the primers and then ran them in a wet tumbler for about an hour so they're all nice and shiny and clean now one thing you may have noticed when we were looking at the gun i am getting some pretty hard hits on the brass deflector there so i don't know if it's gas is still set a little bit too hot or i, I might just put a freaking uh piece of felt or like half of a piece of velcro there or something just to soften the blow but definitely getting some brass dings let me see if i can find a piece that took a pretty good hit here's a piece there we go you know nothing terrible nothing terrible at all just a lot of them got dings and we'll be handling this brass and you know messing with it a lot more as we go through the resizing and loading process but as of right now where all i did was decap them and tumble them i haven't found any bad pieces or pieces that are damaged to the point where they wouldn't be reloadable so we definitely did get some ejector marks on the brass yeah there you go right right at the top there at 12 o'clock you might see a little circle nothing bad like no no burrs raised up or anything crazy like that from the factory ammo just a little imprint of that bolt face nothing i'm going to worry about so that's what we're working with as far as brass goes now for bullets i've got more but i want to kind of keep the focus a little bit narrowed here because that's what i've run into in previous projects like this like here in the first video i'll shoot like 30 freaking bullets and 62 powders and it just ends up being a confusing mess i mean you get a lot of feedback as, as far as you know what bullet a gun might like or what powders might be giving better velocity but it just gets it gets to be a freaking mess so as you can see we've got three bullets from hornady the first is the same bullet that i showed you a second ago the one that is We've already seen in the factory ammo the 105 grain boat tail hollow point. The other match bullet is the 108 grain ELD match. This is what they're going to be loading in their factory match ammo, I believe. I think some of that has made it out into the wild, but I wasn't able to find any in stock to order some. So whatever. I, I really don't care. At some point, maybe we'll get a box just to see what their velocities look like. But I am interested in the bullet and seeing how it's going to shoot in our six millimeter arc. The last bullet here is the 103 grain ELDX, right? The X stands for expanding. So this is a hunting bullet. To be honest, like I wanna see how it's gonna shoot. Like, I don't know, we may find that for match purposes, the gun prefers the 103 ELDX over the 108 ELD match, whatever. I mean, they're they're both good bullets, so, you know, whatever. But I'm afraid that for hunting purposes, we're not gonna be able to get the velocity we would need out of a 103 grain bullet to get that effective range we're looking for. But we're gonna test it, we're gonna see what sort of velocities we can get, and we'll do some math, and maybe we'll shoot some ballistic gel and all of that sort of stuff. There's a lot of options in that 85, 90, and 95 grain range. Like I mentioned earlier, we had a lot of uh, success with the six millimeter WOA and the uh, 90 grain, was that a 90 or a 95? I can never remember, whatever. But the, uh, yeah, it was a 90 grain, sierra game changer that bullet shot really well in that gun so we'll definitely be expanding the search for hunting bullets down to some lighter options the last bullet i want to test i wanted to get a sierra bullet because i love sierra bullets this is the 107 grain sierra match king yep that right there that should be a good 
bullet to compare with the 105 grain and the 108 grain. That should be, yeah, that should be more than enough to get started with. We might load up, you know, some of all of them. We could probably just use the same load data for all of them. So maybe that's what we'll do. We'll pick a couple powders, pick a couple charge weights, and then just load all four bullets with each charge weight. Now for dies right now, what I've got is the RCBS uh, small base taper crimp set. They call these their AR series. Yeah, there you go. It's the group AR dies. These are, you know, so the sizing die is a small base resizing die, but we've used these die kits quite a bit. Like uh, there's a 224 Valkyrie set. Can you even see my finger? Yeah, you can see my finger. There's a 300 blackout set. We've got a three. We've got a we've got a 308 sizing die. It says group A dies. I don't remember if that's whatever, but you get the point. We've tried out these these series of dies, and while they are small base dies, like I haven't really found that they're oversizing our brass really bad, or they're difficult to use, or they're prone to stick cases, or the brass life goes to crap because they they're all stretching because you're oversizing them, you know, that sort of stuff. The stuff you might worry about if you choose a small base sizing die. Haven't really noticed it. They've just been pretty good dies. So we'll try those out. I'll, I have a set of Hornady dies on order, but they're stuck in back order with the brass. So I tried to order a couple hundred pieces of brass plus a set of Hornady dies. And I never imagined that the brass would be back ordered for months. So what I need to do, I need to call up I think it was Mid-South Shooter Supply where I ordered them and just have them go ahead and ship the stupid dies and either cancel the brass or separate the two, whatever. I need my dies, right? But for the time being, this RCBS set will be just fine for us to get started with. We'll deal with additional dies later and comparing them and all of that stupid crap. Now the sizing die, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the bullet seating die in here, we probably won't use it. We'll probably use one of the Hornady dies yeah, we'll probably use the Hornady die. I'm trying to remember, I think I bought one for six millimeter back during the uh, six millimeter WOA project. I'm not sure where that stupid thing went. Eh, whatever, I'll look, I'll look more later. So what we need to do next, well, we need to size brass. That's probably the, the first step here. But we also need to come up with a way to test our bullets and see how long we can load them. So that's, yeah, that's what we'll do first. Let me go get a Dremel tool. Okay, folks, so it's me from the future, and there's a portion of this video that I'm gonna cut out, and it's the entire discussion about measuring maximum overall length for my chamber, because I had absolutely nothing but problems. What I did was took a resized piece of brass, cut a slit down the throat, and then we would set a bullet in it, and then I would you know, carefully chamber it, you know, letting the, the rifling seat the bullet, and then remove it and take an overall length measurement. That, that's how I do it for most cartridges. And I absolutely cannot get consistent readings out of this gun. And even when I did think I was getting reasonably consistent readings, later on in the video, when we get to bullet seating, there were a couple of the bullets where the overall length I chose wouldn't fit in the gun. I had to seat them shorter because they were hitting the lands, like our factory ammo. So this entire subject I'm gonna be pushing it to the next video. I'm gonna try and get a hold of a, a modified case like this. This is one for the 6.5 Grendel. This is a modified case for the Hornady overall length gauge. I haven't been able to find one in stock to order yet, but I mean, worse, if I have to, I'll take this one and see if I can form it to six arc and see if maybe with the Hornady tool, we can get better numbers, more consistent readings than I was getting with my, with my hillbilly method. I don't really know what's going on. So next video, we'll think about it some more. We'll test some more. We'll pull out the bore scope and look and see what's going on in there. Maybe compare it to a Grendel and some other cartridges and see if maybe we can see if there's anything that could explain what I've been going through. So that's where we'll leave that. Basically, all of the discussion about overall length in this video is garbage. All of the load data I'm gonna show you on the screen is gonna be the numbers that finally fit in my gun. So if what you're seeing on the screen is not matching what I'm saying at that particular time, just know that the text on the screen was put there at the end when I was editing it, and that's what you should go by. Oh, what a mess. All right, let's, uh, let's move right along. So let's start out by removing the seating stem from this RCBS die. 
There it is, that's our seeding stem. And let's grab one of these 105 grain Hornady bullets and see, yeah, that's not the world's worst fit. It's not great, but hopefully it's good enough so that we're not scarring up our bullets, right? So that's what we ran into with 6WOA as we were causing rings around the bullet where the seeding stem was making contact. Hopefully this will be better. And this is a taper crimp seeding die. So we should be able to, let me get the, get that out of the way. So we should be able to run this all the way up. And then our seeding stem, I've got it backed out as far as it'll go. Okay, I should be able to turn, uh, screw this down until I feel it touch. And that will be the taper crimp touching the mouth of the case. There it is right there. So let's back off, uh, I don't know, two turns. We could probably read the instructions, but whatever. It doesn't really matter. So now our seating stem, we can go ahead and screw it down and it'll go down and make contact with the bullet. There it is right there. And I need to put the lock nut back on there. These are a pain in the ass to adjust. I've become spoiled by using micro adjustable seating, uh, seating dies almost exclusively. But these get the job done as well, just a little bit harder to adjust. So let's get a baseline number from this guy. I'm reading 1.751. Now my measurement said this needs to go all the way down to 1.715. So 35 thousandths. If we looked at the standard overall length, 2.256. My measurement said it should be around 2.217. So that's a few more thousandths than our ogive measurement, whatever. So hopefully what we can do is just bump this down slowly. 1.752, is that what I said the first time? Yep, it's 1.752, let me write that down. So we've got it to where the stem is just barely touching the bullet, so let's go down a half turn. I don't have any idea how much a half, how much a half turn is going to change it, but it should be a little, at least. So let's seat that and take another measurement. All right, that's a pretty good jump. So that's, we moved it 12 thousandths. So now we're at 1.740. So let me grab the upper and we'll see if the cartridge will chamber. So we're putting it in the same way we were doing earlier and it should go in and click pretty easy. It clicked, but it wasn't that easy. Oh, come out of there. Okay, so it came out. Let's see if it pulled the bullet out. Nope, it didn't pull the bullet out, but it definitely still still jammed into the lands a little bit. So that was 1.740. So this time let's go down a quarter of a turn. All right, that might be just a little bit more than a quarter of a turn. Okay, okay, so it came out to 1.730. Try it again. Okay, we want it to go in uh, pretty dang freely. And that seems to. Cool. So let's go to the next one and seed it. And we'll see if we get the same number. Yep, we do, 1.730. And that one also seems to be chambering pretty easy. Good. So I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and run through the rest of this box of ammo and get them all done while we've got the die set up. Might as well. Okay, let's move on for crying out loud. I'm dying here. Let's do some actual reloading. So first step is going to be to resize our brass. So we got four different bullets. I say we shoot uh, 10 shots of each bullet. We'll pick out two powders and we'll shoot five shot groups with each powder and bullet combination. All right, so I'm going to use Hornady One Shot case lube, this stuff, the spray on stuff. A lot of people hate this stuff, but I've had pretty good luck with it. I, I had never used it before and I got this can in the kit with this Hornady press and I thought, eh, hey, whatever, I'll give it a shot. Like I had completely avoided it because everybody always told me it sucked. And my favorite for a long time has been uh, lanolin, you know, lanolin and alcohol blend which works great and I still love it, but it is a bit greasy, you know, and what I normally end up doing with lanolin lube is lubing them, sizing them, and then tumbling them again just to get the lube off. But this Hornady One Shot actually dries and doesn't really leave a greasiness behind. You know, and, and it says on here, will not contaminate powder or primers. I haven't run into any problems that I thought was powder contamination due to this stuff, so 
I don't know. That's what we're going to use. You watch. I'll freaking stick a case now. I just had to open my mouth. So they tell you, you shoot it down at a 45 degree angle. So you get some down into the case mouths and they tell you to make sure you get the entire side of the body. You'll notice this loading tray here. This is a uh, Frankfurt Arsenal perfect fit reloading tray. A number four fits these cases really nicely, but you'll see like a good portion of the case is down in there. I haven't run into any problems. So just kind of lubing this upper part seems to be working out for me. I don't know. We'll see. I'm really setting myself up for a stuck case. Like I, I can just, I can feel it coming. Small base dies, not lubing the bottom half of the case, using the lube that everybody hates. I mean, if I, if I don't stick a case here, I don't know what's going on. I'm pretty liberal with it then flip it around and hit it again. And then always make sure to give it plenty of time to dry. This stuff dries pretty darn fast, most of it, but I like to let them sit for, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, something like that. The other thing that stuff says it's good for is for lubing your dies, especially when you get a new, uh, a new die set, you know, these sit on the shelves for 25 years. So most of the manufacturers are pretty liberal when it comes to the, comes to oiling them up, which I'm not complaining. So I'm going to wipe this off with a paper towel and then shoot a little bit of one shot into it. Tell you what, here's another thing I like about these RCBS dies. The expander ball, like the, uh, you know, the bottom part of it here has got a nice taper to it. So if you got cases like we do with dinged up case mouths, it's pretty good about smoothly expanding them. Some of the ones that are a little, are a little bit uh, more blunt can make life a little bit more difficult, but the RCBS ones do a pretty nice job. All right, just a little, uh, all right, so just a quick shot up inside of there maybe, maybe a little bit on there and we'll call that good enough. Okay, so our sizing die is about ready to go. One thing about these RCBS is they have got a freaking decapping pin that's about two and a half feet long. So that decapping pin really sticks out, but you can see the beginning of the expander there is just about in the right spot. So we're pretty much ready to size once we give this stuff just a minute to, to, uh, to dry a little bit more. And I'll tell you what, while we're doing that, let me, uh, let me pull out the instructions. Yeah, there we go, AR series reloading dies. Okay, so our sizing die instructions tell us to screw the die down until it touches the shell holder, then drop the ram and go an additional quarter turn. We're not going to do that, and I'll show you why in just a second, especially on this press. What we need to do is take a measurement of our headspace so we've got a baseline to work with. So the Hornady Headspace Comparator Kit, kind of similar to that bullet comparator we were just using. Yeah, these two pieces go together. Okay, tighten that down, and then throw it onto your calipers. There we go. So now what this is going to read is the distance from our cartridge base to a spot on the shoulder of our brass. Now this, these kits comes with, with uh, several sizes. This is the B350. Now, why did I choose a B350? If you look on the Sammy print, you'll see there's a line drawn across the shoulder there that says 0 0.350. And these numbers are pretty standard. So like you'll see 0 0.330, 0 0.350, 0 0.375, 0 0.400. And these headspace comparators come in those sizes. So that's what the size of that hole is right there. So if we take a fired piece of brass, well, first of all, what we need to do is zero out our calipers. Yeah, if we take a fired piece of brass and get it fitted in there, I'm getting 1.1915. If we move on to the next one, it is 1.1915. And if we move on to the next one, it is 1.1915. This number should always come out very consistent because this brass has been fire formed to my chamber. So they've all of the all of this brass has been fired with the same load, the same bullet, the same pressures more or less in the exact same chamber, and they fire form to that. So we should see very consistent numbers. So I'm gonna write that down. So the next question is what was the brass when it was new? Just out of curiosity. So we can put this guy right up in here, getting 1.1825. So what is that, nine thousandths difference? Yep, the next one is the same number, 1.1825. You won't always see the exact same number with new brass or a box of factory ammo. Like if we test a few more, we should be seeing some numbers that don't line up perfectly, but they're usually pretty darn close. 
There we go. This one's a thousandth and a half shorter, 1.181. So for our fired brass, that means the new cartridge blew the shoulder out almost 10 thousandths. So the shoulder moved forward almost 10 thousandths. And when that happens, the source of that brass to lengthen that cartridge base to your headspace datum line, they call it, is generally right down here. So the cartridge stretches, that gets a little bit thinner. So now that we're about to resize this again, we know that, uh, you know, that first firing, we got a little bit thinner here. So what we want to do from this point forward is we want to minimize the amount that we bump the shoulder back. Like we don't want to move this 10 thousandths back and then let it fire form again, 10 thousandths forward, and then constantly 10 thousandths, 10 thousandths. That's going to shorten our case life and we're going to end up with case head separations if we're oversizing our brass. So while our sizing die instruction said to screw it down until it touches, go a quarter of a turn, that'd probably work, but that might be too much sizing. So let's get over to the press. Let's test that out. Let's see what numbers we get when we follow the instructions. All right, so let's remove our bullet seating die. I probably should have went and just grabbed a, another Hornady lock and load bushing but I didn't. So we'll just do things the hard way. So we raise our ram all the way to the top, screw it down until it touches. Then we drop the ram and go a quarter turn and then tighten the lock ring. So there it is by the instructions. Now the problem, which is kind of hard to explain on a video, I can't even, if I really, really pushed hard, I might be able to get this to go down. It won't go. That die is way too low. And the reason is because this Hornady press has got a very aggressive cam over. If I'm not feeling too lazy, I'll try and get a close up and insert it here so you can see it. But at the top, actually, hey, I happened to get the camera lined up just right. So right now the ram, the handle is all the way down. So you would think that the ram would be all the way up, but it's not. Like I'll lift the handle a little bit and you'll see it actually goes up a little bit. So as you bring down the handle, the ram comes up, and then at the very last second, it comes back down. So with this Hornady press, m m most presses or the presses I've used are not quite this aggressive with the cam over, but this Hornady is very aggressive. So if you are trying to set something up kind of by the instructions that RCBS gave us, you bring it down until it touches, and then you kind of lift the handle a little bit, and you can kind of s seek out that the kind of the, the true top of the stroke, which there it is right about right there. So now if we go down a quarter turn from that spot and tighten the lock ring, now we've probably got something that's a little bit more manageable. Yep, man, that's still, you can hear that handle popping at the bottom of that stroke. That's just too much. It's just too dang much. So I'm gonna try and back this out a little bit which this is a pain in the ass with the, the Hornady lock and load kit because their bushing doesn't lock in. Some of the Lee presses with their quick change die setup, when the die goes down in, there's a little pin that locks it in place. This, this Hornady is not that way. Maybe some Hornady's, Hornady's presses do. I don't know. This one doesn't and it drives me freaking crazy. So like this die that I need to back out like an eighth of a turn I need to back it out until the bushing quits moving and then there we go do my little bit of a turn so yeah you just you got to navigate the quirks of your bushing system i guess man that's still awful awfully hard i'm going to back it out just a little bit more okay that was maybe a 30 second of a turn there we go so you can you can hear it's still uh making extremely solid contact with the die. So, okay, whatever. We'll consider this to be by the instructions. So let's grab our first piece of brass and let's just size it with this setting and pray to God that it doesn't get stuck in the die. So up and into the die and then down and out, nice and smooth. So I should have shown you before I put it in there, but this one did have a particularly dingy neck so all that got ironed out nicely and it's yeah, nicely resized. So let's take a headspace measurement of this guy and our number is 1.184. That's actually really good. So that's about 1.5 thousandths longer than the factory brass on the factory ammo. So that's kind of good. Some dies, whenever you set them up like this, where they're all the way down, they bump that shoulder a ridiculous amount, way shorter than even, you know, factory new brass. So this is good. Let's see, 1.8, uh, uh, let me do some math. Okay, so that is seven thousandths of bump. That's what we would say 
or that's how we would say it. So we, we just bump the shoulder seven thousandths. That's more than we need. Now for a bolt action rifle, sometimes you'll just size the neck. You won't even bump the shoulder. Or if we're using a full length sizing die like this and we're shooting a bolt action, we might just barely bump it. Like try and bump it a half or one thousandth of an inch because you don't need any more. But with a semi-automatic rifle, we wanna make sure to, you know, size it enough so that our gun runs smoothly. and We don't have malfunctions. But even when you're looking for that, we don't need seven thousandths like we've got now. We need more like two or maybe, I don't know, three. So let's try and do that. Let's try and set up this die to bump the shoulder two thousandths. Let me wipe all of this uh, lube off of my loading block. There it is. So there's our first piece of resized brass. All right, so let me try and back this guy out. Eh, that was probably almost a quarter turn. So at this point, it, may, it might look like on camera that it's making contact, but like I'm not feeling any contact whatsoever. So here's another thing we should uh, pay attention to, which I should have done on that other piece. Let's see how much this piece grows as far as the length of the brass. 1.480 is what we've got right now. Let's write that down. Okay, let's size it. Yep, there we go. And we'll see how much that grew because the sizing process is when your brass is going to get longer. So I'm seeing about 1.486 or there's 1.485 and a half. Yeah, I think 1.486 is about the right number. That's a fair amount of stretch. Now, here's something funny for you. This piece that we just sized is now, the headspace number is 1.1955. This number actually got longer. How is that even possible? Well, sometimes when you've got the die too high and it never actually makes contact with the shoulder of the case, but it made contact with the body of the case, right? So the case, the body of the case was getting squeezed, which kind of lengthened things, but the shoulder never got hit by the shoulder portion of our sizing die. So this is actually longer. So at this point, we're not touching the shoulder. I went way too far back, okay? So I just went back about a half, half the distance, so maybe about an eighth of a turn. Our ram is making very light contact with the, with the die now. Now the piece I just resized, I'm not gonna, continue to use it and size it over and over and over. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next piece because that would put a ridiculous amount of wear on this piece of brass because as the brass goes up in, the neck gets squeezed down, then the expander ball on the decapping pin gets pulled through it. So you're constantly making that neck small and then big and small and big, plus the additional work that's being done to the body and the shoulder. Let's just move on to the next one. So let's see. I should have measured its length. I forgot all about it. We'll check that once we get our once we get our die right where we want it. Then we'll see how much the, the rounds are stretching. Yep, this one's still long, 1.930. Okay, down a little bit farther, a little bit more contact with the shell holder there. Let's see what this one gives us. Oh, we're getting really close now. So 1.1905. So that is one thousandth shorter than our original number. So this would actually be just about right. Like this would probably be just fine, but let's shoot for two. Let, let's try and get to 1.1900 or, you know, 1.1895. So let me see if I can just get this to, nope, can't do it. Okay, and this one will monitor the length of the brass. Yep, this is the same as the last one we measured at 1.480. See how much it stretches. Yeah, a little bit more than the last one, so 1.487, so it stretched seven thousandths. And I went just a little bit too far on the headspace, 1.189. So we're currently bumping it two and a half thousandths. So this one, we went a little bit too far, but it's, a, it's done now. So we'll put it in the loading block. Let me see if I can just move it out a smidgen. These are extremely small adjustments. Tell you what, this brass length is consistent, so 1.479 and a half. So just a half a thousand shorter than the other pieces we've measured. And let's hope, hope we got that headspace number dialed in just right. And it looks just right. 1.1895, so that's exactly two thousandths shorter than our original number. So that's good, fantastic. Two thousandths a shoulder bump. The other nice thing, it's actually good. Like, you know, we're actually touching the shell holder the case is getting, you know, put up into the sizing die almost completely, right? I mean, we've only backed out just a couple thousandths, 
So we're getting the full body resize. I've had some dies that, well, in particular, I, I, I can't blame the die. It was my first 6.5 Grendel. Like the chamber was just long or something because the sizing die I used with that, like I had to have it backed way out and there was a gap between the shell holder and the sizing die. It never really caused me any problems. I never had any function issues, but I always worried about it because I wasn't able to, to get the body of that case fully up into the die so it could you know, be properly resized. We'll double check the next couple here. Yep, that one's perfect. Check the length again, 1.481 before and after about 1.487. This so was at six or seven, something like that. So cases seem to be stretching a fair amount, but it's not really a straightforward comparison to test cartridge length before and after resizing. The question will be, like, I don't even know what the trim length is or, you know, whether we're gonna to need to trim these, but the true question will be, how much did they grow? So after sizing this time to after sizing next time, how much are, you know, are the, are the cases growing in that context? So that's pretty much it for sizing. I just need to, I just need to work my way through the rest of them. I'll leave the camera on that way in case I stick a case, I'll bring you back and we can all laugh at me. Now, one thing I should mention while I'm finishing these up, still no stuck cases, by the way, I'm 25 pieces in and all is well. But after all of that headspace discussion we just had, I, I should mention that sometimes you will see differences in headspace coming out of a chamber or coming out of a sizing die. If you're shooting mixed brass, you know, different brands, different uh, brass types react a little bit differently. Like maybe during the firing process, they spring back a little more than another brand, or maybe one batch has got five firings on it and it's become work hardened and the, the other batch is brand new and it's nice and soft. Things like that will affect the headspace number. So it's not, it's not a huge deal. It's just something you gotta be aware of so you know what's happening whenever you see it and adjust accordingly. All right, that's the last piece and it didn't get stuck. So another successful outing for Hornady One-Shot Lube. All right, so I got bad news. The length on most of these is 1486, 1487, but there are a couple, like, uh, let me see if I can find, oh yeah, this one here is 1491 and a half. They show a maximum case length on the Hornady load data sheet of 1490. So that one's pretty darn close, but there was one or two of them that were like pretty long. There's a 1493, 1493. Yeah, there's that, that one's 1495. So we need to trim. I was hoping we didn't need to trim, but we need to trim. So I think I'm gonna do this the hard way with my RCBS Trim Pro. Frankfurt Arsenal case trim and prep center that I was thinking about pulling out, but a little bit faster, but this is easier. Well, that statement didn't really make any sense. Talk about doing it the hard way and say this is easier. It's uh, less annoying to set up, I guess. Just a little bit more manual labor. Now the load data sheet shows a case trim length of 1.475. So that's 15,000 shorter than the maximum length. I don't think I'm gonna go quite that short. I've seen some others where the, the trim length was 15 thousandths less than max, but it's usually 10. Most of your load manuals or your, yeah, you'll see a 10 thousandths differential. So let's just shoot for that. I'll, I'll, I'll trim them all to 1.480. I need to grab the proper Allen wrench. I hate, I hate these things, hate them. All right, let's see where that puts us. Nope, oh, barely touched it, 1.489. So I need to go 9 thousandths. And it's been so long since I used these, this trimmer. It's got like a graduated uh, scale on it, but I don't know if that's thousandths of an inch or if that's just random dashes. All right, we'll move it by five and see what that does. Yeah, 1.485. So I guess those dashes or uh, yeah, that scale actually means something. It's been so long since I used this darn thing. I used to pull off the handle and put a drill on there, I think it was, or I don't know, it's been a while. All right, hopefully that's it right there. Oh, right on the money. Perfect. So that's what I'll do is trim each one. Then we'll take our chamfering and deburring tool, hit it on the inside, hit it on the outside. And there we go. That guy is ready for a primer. All right, let's do one more here. Trimmed, inside, outside. Looking good. 
Double check the length on this second one. Perfect. Totally perfect. So I'll get these knocked out and then we'll be ready to start talking load data because it's primer powder bullets and we're going to hit the range and it's currently 11.30 p.m. So that might be tomorrow morning. I don't know. For you, it's right now. Okay, so it's the next morning. I'm feeling good, feeling refreshed, feeling sharp. And it's time to pick out some load data for these first 40 shots. I pulled out six powders that are listed on the Hornady load data. One that I think we should go ahead and definitely test is Hodgton CFE-223. This is the highest velocity option they show, so we'll give it a shot. The second powder is a tougher choice. Let's have a look at the chart here. This chart's kind of deceiving, so you gotta keep an eye on that velocity for each column. They switch from increments of 100 feet per second for the first three columns, and then they go to 50 for the next three columns, and then the last column is 25. So this is not a linear chart here, folks. They're kind of deceiving us a little bit. So CFE-223 and Lever Evolution aren't quite as uh, far ahead of the others as it appears. My first thought was that we should try maybe an extruded powder. You know, CFE-223 is a ball powder, so I thought maybe for the other one we'd choose an extruded powder. Not a lot of extruded options here on the list. Well, I shouldn't say that, but like there's Reloader 15, N140, Varget 8208 XBR, and H4895. Those are kind of the extruded options on the list, and I'm sure we'll get to all of them eventually. But what's kind of jumping out at me is Power Pro Varmint. I've had good success with that powder in some other cartridges. It's one of our 2,500 feet per second options here on their chart. So let's just go with that. Now, I'm not that worried about kind of starting a little bit higher than we otherwise might, because remember, these are 52,000 PSI loads. So as long as our, you know, as long as our bolt holds together, as long as our gun holds together, we're not gonna be, you know, popping primers and blowing, having case head separations and that sort of stuff that you would be worried about as you were approaching the limits of the brass and stuff. So I tell you what, let's jump down one step from max for each of them. So let me grab my notebook. All right, Power Pro Varmint. Let's shoot 27.2 grains, and that tells us that'll be about 2,450 feet per second. And with CFE-223, let's shoot 28.8 grains, which they say should be 2,550. Okay, good. That was easy. Now for primers, they uh, tested with the Federal 205. I don't have any 205s right now, but I do have some of the 205Ms. Yeah, there we go. 205 M's. These are just the, the uh, gold metal match version. So we'll go with those. Why not? Now for a good little while, I've been using the CCI 450 primers, which are actually small rifle Magnum primers in the 6.5 Grendel. I've never really had many problems with primers in the Grendel or ignition issues that I could can remember, but we'll keep an eye out for any of that, right? Both of these are ball powders, which are the, you know, which is the, the more challenging powder to ignite. So if, you know, if we run into any, I don't know, wildly varying velocities or, you know, even hang fires or delayed ignition, that sort of deal, we've got other primers we can try, whatever. The GM 205Ms, those are good primers. I don't expect we'll have any problems whatsoever. So our brass is ready to go. It's all trimmed and completed. So the next step is primers. So I pulled out the Lee hand priming tool. I found the shell holder that seems to fit these the best. Yeah, there we go, the number one. So that a little loose. The number two is a pretty good fit. I could freaking uh, just Google it so I know I've got the right one, but whatever, we're fine. Switch out the cartridge in this guy from large primers to small primers. All right, we're ready to go. See if I can get these in the tray without spilling them. Okay, looking good. All right, got them shaking around to flip them over the right way. Come on, there's always one. There we go. And ready to go. Put that into there. Switch it to the on position. Cycle it once, and of course our first one ends up sideways. There it is, little jiggle. Little jiggle got it straightened out. All right, that primer pocket feels good. Like that felt nice and tight. Took a decent amount of force to get the primer up in there. It's sitting in there nice, just below flush. And that's good. Okay, second one. Feels about the same, feels good. Now, I did pull out our little go-no-go -no -go gauge for primer pockets, right? This, this thing came in extremely handy when we were doing 224 Valkyrie and having all sorts of primer pocket problems. It's a, uh, yeah, swage gauge from Ballistic Tools. 
These things aren't terribly expensive and I found them pretty handy. So what you do is you take your piece of brass there. Now the small end should go down into the primer pocket without any problem. So it's definitely big enough. And then the big end, if we flip it around, should not go in. And that is definitely not going in. So let me run through a few just with the no-go side. Yeah, wrong end, there we go. Yeah, that one's not going in. That one's not going in. That one's probably, it's going in more than the others. Like it goes in just the tiniest little bit, but it's definitely not, yeah, no matter how much wiggling I do, I can't get it to go all the way in. Let's see if this one feels a little bit looser than the others. It, it kind of did, like it just kind of went in a little bit smoother. It still felt like okay though, which, you know, you're going to have that. You're going to have some pockets that aren't quite as tight as the others. That one's good. That one's good. That one's, that one's kind of like that previous one where eh, it kind of goes in just the tiniest little bit, but it doesn't go all the way in, not even close. So I think, you know, I think we're good. I'm not going to test them all, but as I'm priming them, I'll certainly be paying attention to how they feel. Like here's one that was supposed to be a little bit tighter. Yeah, like maybe just a hair tighter than those other two. Okay, now the boring part of weighing out all these charges. Since I'm only loading 20 with each powder, it's not really worth the time to fill up my powder measure. So I'm gonna just do these by hand. And I did, uh, I've been warming up my scale. I ran it through a calibration. I'm gonna check it with some check weights really quick just to make sure everything is okay. It's been a long time since I've used my scale or loaded anything. So 20, uh, 20 grain check weight reads 20.0, that's good. Let's add in five more, 25.0, two more, 27.0, good. So we're right on the number. I do have my Lee scoop kit. Yeah, one of these with a big old bunch of scoops. So we'll find the one that gets us close. I bet it's gonna be this 1.9 cc. Yep, that came out to 29.8, so that's a little bit too much. Let's see what the 1.6 gives us. 1.6 gives us 25, so we'll go with that. Now, and I did something extremely stupid, right? I left both powders on the bench here. Luckily, you know, I caught it soon enough to remember like, yep, varmint is what I poured in. So we're just gonna take CFE 223 off the bench. Now, if I got a phone call or went to the bathroom or something, then came back, it's like, crap, I think that's varmint. I hope that's varmint. That sort of thing can get you in trouble. So always try and work with only one powder on the bench at any time. All right, 27.2. So I just need to weigh out 20 of these, then switch powders and weigh 20 more. So I'll do that and see you guys at the bullet seating die. Okay, so the charges are weighed. I've sat bullets into all the cases here. Gotta be careful not to get myself mixed up. So my loading block, I took a Sharpie and put a V on one end for PowerPro Varmint and a C on the other end for CFE 223. So hopefully I can keep this stuff straight. I did leave our sizing die in the Hornady lock and load bushing and I made a little, little kind of index mark there on the die and the bushing and also put one on the press there because we got this sizing die set up nicely. Might as well just leave it that way. So I've got a new bushing in here. This is going to be quite an adventure here with this seating die. So let's start out with the 103 grain ELDX. We'll go from light to heavy. So we'll do the 103, the 105, the 107, and then the 108. So let's run a piece of brass up into the die. We'll screw it down until we feel it. The taper crimp, touch that case mouth, just like we did earlier. Okay, there it is. And we'll back it out. Eh, we'll back it out one turn. That should be more than enough especially since we just trimmed all of this brass. They're all the exact same length. We don't need to worry about a, you know, a long piece, maybe getting up in there a little farther and hitting the, the taper crimp. I'm not gonna do any crimping whatsoever with this cartridge. Nothing wrong with crimping if that's your thing, but uh, yeah, we're just not gonna do any here with the six millimeter arc in the short term. So I backed out our adjustment, adjusting stem a little bit. So let's just seat the first one and see where it goes. Now on the load data, they call for an overall length of 2.245. We're gonna go a little bit longer than that. You know, we tested each bullet in the chamber earlier and all of that crap, and we know that we can go out to at least 2.260 with all of them, okay? So right now, I'm at about 2.290. And another thing, that the first seating here on the 103, you might see a little bit of a ring 
forming there where the seating stem touched the die. I did uh, go ahead and get seating stems on order. Uh, Hornady offers a custom seating stem for the 108 ELDM and also the, uh, what is it, the 110 grain ATEP. I'm gonna go, go ahead and get both stems. But So between those two custom stems plus the standard six millimeter stem that comes with the die, once we get the die, that variety of stems should, should give us options that will work with just about everything. Let's go a half turn. What did I say, it's 2.290? Yeah, let's see what a half turn on the adjustment gets. Maybe we can figure out about how much each adjustment gets us. So that's a half turn. Now we're at uh, 2.271. So a half turn equals about 20 thousandths. So one turn is 40 thousandths. Can we remember that? I think we can remember that. Which means that another quarter turn should put us pretty darn close. And I'm gonna go a little bit less than a quarter turn. Let's seat this one and see where we're at. Yeah, that's uh, just about perfect, 2.2605. Let's get a cartridge-based ogive measurement. I think it should be around 1.720. Nope, a little bit less than that, 1.715. And after seating that bullet a couple times, our spot on the bullet is a little bit more pronounced. It's just kind of scuffed. It doesn't feel like we've got like a proper groove or anything. So hopefully it won't affect performance too much. Let's seat the next one and see if the number comes out the same. There it is. They're seating pretty smooth. Yeah, it came out exactly the same. 1.715 and a total overall length of 2.2605. Good, I like it. Now the question is will it fit in the gun? And I'm gonna try and bring the upper up here and chamber these guys without knocking over my loading tray. Some pretty advanced coordination going on here. Okay, here's the first one. It's clicking in and clicking out okay. All right, so I think we're good. Now these are the CFE 223 loads. The case fill was pretty good with these. Like it, it seemed to be down a little bit below the shoulder. Like, you know, pretty nice full case, but plenty of room for the bullet. And I do feel a little bit of powder moving when I shake it. So let's go ahead and seat the other three of these. And I'll just spot check another one for cartridge-based ogive length, just for the heck of it. 1.7155, perfect. Now, since it's not compressed, we should be able to go over to our Power Pro Varmint load and just use this exact same seating die setting and get the exact same overall length. Because the case fill was a little bit less with Power Pro Varmint. Certainly feel some powder moving inside the case and it's exactly the same, 1.7155. So that's good news. Okay, so our next bullet is the 105 grain Boattail hollow point. Now this is the one we need to go shorter, right? So our target overall length, I wanna try and match the factory ammo or what we set the factory ammo to once we fixed it. So let me grab a piece of this. I'm gonna back the stem out just a little bit, run this up into the die. Okay, so that's pretty close. Now keep in mind, if I just screw this down until it, I feel it, the stem touch the bullet, I'm gonna end up being in trouble because of that aggressive cam over we talked about earlier. So I'm gonna actually back this out just a little bit and move the, uh, move the handle around a little bit to try and find about where we need to be. Yeah, that's as close as I feel safe going. Hopefully that made sense, right? But that puts us in the ballpark. We'll probably be a couple thousandths too long. So here's the first one. Let's hope, uh, hope that wasn't a dumb move. So 1.730 is what we set the factory ammo to, cartridge-based ogive, 1.7345. So we're four and a half thousandths long right now. The overall length of the factory ammo was right about 2.230, and we're about six thousandths long. Good, 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 good. So we know that a full turn is 40, a half turn is 20, a quarter turn is 10, and we need to go six, is that right? No, we need to go four. Yeah, we need to go about four. So let's see if we can nail this on the first adjustment. A tenth of a turn, right? Hopefully that's close. Ah, still a little bit long, 1.731. So just I'm just gonna breathe on it. Ah, these dies are such a pain in the butt to adjust. Uh, that, I may have just went too far. Hopefully it's not way too much. Nope, that's actually right on the number. 1.730 cartridge-based ogive should be a total overall length of right about 2.230. And it's pretty close, 2.233. And just to be sure, 
it. Let's try and chamber this guy. Okay, up it goes. Goes right into battery. And comes out of battery. Good. So that's the process. I mean, I guess I don't need to walk you through the last two bullets. It's going to be exactly the same. So I'll flip the camera back on if I run into any problems, but if I don't run into problems, I guess I'll just see you on the range. So I did end up running into some problems with the last two bullets, the 107 grain Sierra Match King and the 108 grain ELD Match. Neither one of them fit in my gun at the overall length I had written down. So the, the Sierra Match King wasn't bad and they would actually go into battery. You just really kind of had to push harder than I felt like. So I think it was right up onto those lands. So I just bumped that back about two thousandths. So those are still tucked right up next to the lands. Over, average overall length was about 2.258 cartridge base to ogive about 1.708. So I just had to bump those back a couple thousandths. The 108 grain ELD match, I was way off at the 1.715 inch cartridge base to ogive that I thought was going to be off the lands a little bit. I, I could not get them to go in the gun at all. I ended up having to shorten that 13 more thousandths down to 1.702 inches cartridge base to ogive. So ended up with an you know, a, an average overall length right around 2.253. So this is kind of crazy, folks. I can't believe how short the throat is in this gun. And as we, you know, explore more bullets in future videos, maybe we'll find some others that fit a little bit better, let us take better advantage of that full magazine length or even out to like 2.3 inches with our Grendel magazines. I don't know. So hopefully I've been showing you guys the right numbers on the screen all along. But if not, you know, this is these are the overall links that I ended up going going with. So now it's time to go out and see if they'll shoot. So I'll see you on the range. All right, folks, it's time to see how these loads are going to shoot. And I think we'll start off by shooting a few more rounds of the Hornady Black that we seated a little bit shorter. And hopefully it's going to fit in the gun properly now. So that way we can get our gun warmed up, make sure we're sighted in OK and be ready to go before we start with the hand loads. So I think we had things pretty well sighted in last time. We've got five rounds of the magazine. Let's go ahead and start with a five shot group. Oh, I'll tell you what we probably ought to do first is cycle them all through. A couple of those were a little bit, eh, a little bit sticky on the old charging handle. Not seeing any major marks on the brass. I didn't bring calipers out here to like measure them again, make sure none of them had, uh, had like stretched back out when they got slammed into battery. I don't know, whatever. Let's go ahead and see how they shoot. They're certainly a whole lot better fitting than they were. Okay, here we go. Five shot group. Did I for, yep. Why didn't you guys tell me? Like, hey man, drop the bolt jackass. All right, that went way down low. Yeah, and now that I think about it, where our group was in the last video. Yep, I tell you what, let's go ahead and just make a scope adjustment. I think that's about three MOA. All right, let's try this again. Yeah, that's a little bit better. And I tell you what, might as well zoom on in a little bit. And what we can do is hide shot one, act like it never happened through the magic of shot marker. Let's go ahead and put one extra in the magazine and take four more shots. Okay, so that's not too bad, except for the fact I made it to where you couldn't see it. All right, so 1.26 inch, not too bad. Those three there kind of trying to group. So it's about like it was last time. I honestly didn't expect any miraculous improvement, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. Okay, so our factory ammo velocity dropped a little bit from the last test I did with it. It's now down to 2591, when before it was 2640. Uh, like we shot a lot of a lot of rounds. We shot 80 rounds to get that 2640 average 
and I don't remember seeing any shots whatsoever that were all the way down below 2600, like our, you know, our 2591 average that we saw today. So is it weather? It's a little bit cooler today than it was whenever we shot those 80, or is it related to seeding those bullets a little bit deeper and changing the pressures, you know, getting the, the bullets a little farther away from the lands or out of the lands, right? I mean, they were jammed in before. Maybe that was causing that pressure spike that everybody always seems to talk about that you should be uh, wary of as you're approaching the lands with a bullet. I don't know, but we definitely dropped a little bit of velocity. So it's time to move on to our hand loads. We're gonna start out with the 103 grain ELDX, and we're gonna start out with Power Pro Varmint. It's gonna be a five shot group. Our target's at 100 yards, I forgot to mention that. We are using the Shot Marker electronic target system, which I need to clear. So as I mentioned earlier in the video, our barrel is an 18 inch Odin Works. And yeah, you got all the details earlier in the video. So let's move on. Here's our first group, 103 grain ELDX with Power Pro Varmint. I'm gonna cycle a couple of those through, make sure, yep, those went, uh, those went through with no problem. So let's see if they'll group. So we are sighted in with the factory ammo and we know that our velocities are gonna be a little bit lower here, or at least we expect them to be. So I'll be interested to see what happens with our point of impact at the target, need to arm the chronograph. There we are. All right, let's see if they'll group. Okay, that pr hit pretty close to our previous point of impact. Let me run down that piece of brass. Okay, pretty easy to find. I don't see anything crazy going on here. Yeah, it just looks like a good piece of brass. Nothing to freak out about here as far as pressure. Good, let's go ahead and shoot the next four, see if they'll group. So that, I forgot to uh, spot what the first shot's velocity was, but this second shot was 2566. That is much better than the 2450 feet per second that we were expecting from the load data. Interesting. All right, that's a pretty good start. Shot marker shows 0.85 inches. Yep, 0.85 inches. Let's see what the velocity looked like. 2570 was our average. Standard deviation of 9.3 and an extreme spread of 23 feet per second. 0.85 inch group. Man, that is a good start. That is a really good start. I am absolutely shocked by that velocity. I am absolutely shocked. We are 120 feet per second above Hornady's test numbers what like they're uh yeah what they show on their load data what the hell i can't wait to see what this cfe 223 number is i'll tell you what i'm feeling a whole lot better about this whole situation now one thing i should mention which yeah i'm a bit of an idiot here i, I wasn't didn't really have my head screwed on straight remember the load data is for the 108 and 110 grain bullets and this is a 103 so we're five grains lighter than the test bullets. So that might that might explain a good portion of it. So once we get to the 108 grain ELD match, maybe we will lose it. But man, it seems uh, it seems ridiculous to think we would lose 130 feet per second or whatever. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Let me go chase down that brass. All right, folks, we're gonna move on to CFE 223 with that same bullet, 103 grain ELDX. One of the folks who's watching this live on Twitch reminded me, I forgot to mention the cartridge overall length. This is uh, 2.260. So the 103 ELDX is at 2.260. Our Power Pro Varmint uh, powder charge was 27.2 grains. And here with CFE 223, this is 28.8 grains. So let me arm the chronograph. Okay, ready to go. Let's see if uh, CFE 223 will shoot. Okay, let me run down that first piece of brass. Okay, so the first piece of brass looks perfect. It looks outstanding. So nothing to worry about there. And our first velocity, uh, I think it was 25.88. So let's see, what was our average? 25.70 was our average with varmint. So a little bit, a little bit faster than varmint, it looks like. We'll see if they'll group.
Ooh, that doesn't look quite so good. 1.12 inches. See what our velocity numbers were. Average velocity 2575. So only five feet per second faster than we saw with uh, PowerPro Varmint. 10.4 feet per second standard, or, uh, standard deviation, 28 feet per second extreme spread. Those numbers are pretty similar to what we saw, but that group opened up 1.12 inches. That kind of sucks. All right, let me run down the brass. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna move on to the 105 grain Hornady Boattail Hollow Point. We're gonna start out with Power Pro Varmint. Same load, 27.2 grains. Our overall length is 2.230, so these are 30,000 shorter than we uh, seeded the 103 ELDX to. So let's see if they'll group. All right, man, Power Pro Varmint is getting the job done. Holy crap, 0.46 inches, I like it. I was a little bit worried about that bullet, right? Because the factory ammo just wasn't really shooting all that great. I mean, it was kind of shooting like you'd expect factory ammo to, but I was afraid maybe, you know, maybe the gun wouldn't like the bullet. Clearly that was a mistake. All right, let's see what our velocities were. Okay, average velocity, 25.63. So seven feet per second slower than with the 103 grain ELDX. Standard deviation of 7.3, extreme spread of 17. That is fantastic for a ball powder. So that's, you know, back to back single digit standard deviations with Power Pro Varmint. That's good stuff. That's really good stuff. So the brass looked fine. Nothing to worry about there. Okay, folks, moving right along to CFE 223 with the 105 grain Boattail hollow point. Same overall length, same charge weight that we shot with the 103. So this is 28.8 grains of CFE 223. Let's hope it performs better than it did with the 103. Okay, that's not the worst thing in the world. 0 0.80 inch group, I can live with that. Now, the really good thing about this is that 105 grain bullet, just the standard Hornady boat to a hollow point, is by far the cheapest bullet we're shooting today. The ELDs and the, uh, the Sierra Match Kings are a good bit more expensive. So I love it when my gun really likes a cheap bullet. And that seems to be the case here. Now the ballistic coefficient on the Hornady, or you know, the 105 is not quite as good as the other, but it's still a pretty darn slick bullet. I mean, it's, uh, it's no slouch. Okay, velocity there was 2571. So that was eight feet per second faster than we saw with Power Pro Varmint. The last, the last bullet, the differential was five. So we're just barely getting a few, few extra feet per second here with CFE 223, when the low data said we were gonna get 100 feet per second more. Standard deviation 14.5, extreme spread 35. Not exactly terrible, but not even close to as good as we're seeing with Power Pro Varmint. So I did see a few little shiny spots on the case head. Like nothing crazy, definitely no burrs or anything yet. And I've seen the same thing over there with the Power Pro Varmint loads. Like, you know, nothing to freak out about. It's one of those where we get back to the bench and I try and show it to you under the lighting in there and we won't be able to find it sort of deal. So nothing to freak out about. Okay, folks, it's time to move on to the 107 grain Sierra Match King. I am extremely excited to see how these shoot. I love me some Sierra Match Kings. These are just under 2.260. They're 2.258 is what I wrote down. So just a hair under. We're shooting the same loads. So we're starting out with Power Pro Varmint, 27.2 grains of it. Let's see what happens.
All right, that's not bad. That last shot got us, didn't it? Crapola, that's okay, not too shabby. 0.75 inch group, Let's see what our velocities look like. 2526 is the average standard deviation of 12.7, which is the worst we've seen so far with, uh, with Power Pro Varmint. All right, not too bad. Okay, so this, the ejection pattern has been really nice with all of these so far. It's not spraying brass all over the place and they're, you know, back there at about yeah, four o'clock, 4.30, something like that, you know, just behind me. So that's good to see. Brass looked uh, pretty good. Couple little shiny spots like I was mentioning before. So we better just move right along. I, I'm not quite running out of daylight, but I don't have a whole lot of time to be screwing around. See what the, yeah, the barrel's not hot. See what it feels like in here. Yeah, barrel's not too bad at all. So let's move on. Next up is CFE 223 with our 107 grain Sierra Match King. Same load, 28.8 grains. All right, pretty similar group to what we saw with Varmint, 0.84 inches. Let's see what our velocity numbers were, 25.48. With a 9.2 standard deviation, that's the best we've seen with CFE 223 so far. That's good. And an 18 feet per second extreme spread. It's not too bad. That is not too bad at all. Okay, folks, we're down to our last bullet, the 108 grain Hornady ELD match. Overall length on this guy, it's a little, little under 2.260. It's 2.253. And once again, we're shooting the same loads. We're gonna start out with Power Pro Varmint, 27.2 grains. I need to clear my target. And let's move to a new dot there. There it is. Let's see if it'll shoot. Man, if it wasn't for that one that went high. Yeah, that one hurts. Dang it. So that was a 1.10 inch group. Crapola. I mean, you know, not too bad. Occasionally you're gonna lose one high. It does happen. Velocity average was 25.22. Now, this is like I mentioned, back to our load data. This was supposed to be a 2450 feet per second load. So I find it interesting here on a cool day, you know, the temperature is in the 60s, I'm sure. Like it's nice and cool this evening. And we're still 70 feet per second faster than their target. A 4.4 feet per second standard deviation with an 11 feet per second extreme spread. Man, Varmint has really been impressive today with the velocity statistics. And I'm really happy that our point of impact hasn't been moving around a bunch as we switch from bullet to bullet. Sometimes that can be a pain in the pain in the butt when a gun wants to shoot, you know, different bullets all over the freaking place. And I guess we could look at that group. Let's uh, let's take number four out of it and see what it would have been. Yeah, the other four went into 0.63 inches. So that's a little bit disappointing. Tell you what, I'll write that down just so I can remember that uh, we had a bit of a flyer there. The best four was 0.63 inches. Like, you know, that might be significant. All right, folks, one more group to go. I need to clear my target first. Here we go, CFE 223, 22.8 grains of it. baby that is what i'm talking about holy crap look at cfe 223 get the freaking job done 0.35 inches kiss my butt man 
And just, just earlier, I was chatting with people on Twitch about how disappointing CFE 223 always seems to be. It heard us talking. Holy crap. Best group of the day by quite a bit. Oh my God. Oh man. What's this? What's the standard deviation show on shot marker? 3.2. So shot marker shows 3.2. Lab radar says 2.5. Holy crap. So average velocity, 2550, exactly 2550. Standard deviation of 2.5, extreme spread of six. Six, man. <laughs> oh, what a way to finish that target off. Holy crap. That is awesome. So I could not be happier with a first target of hand loads. We shot eight groups, six of them were under an inch, two of them were under a half inch, and we really only had like, you know, yeah, none of it was terrible. None of it was terrible. So really happy so far with this Odin Works barrel. It seems to be getting the job done. The cartridge, you know, this is a, certainly a good start. I'm hoping this brass, you know, we haven't blown out primer pockets or, you know, anything like that. If this brass is going to be durable and it's going to be shooting groups like this with just two random powders that we picked and two random charge weights that we picked like man where are we headed once we get a little work in find the the the, the bullet that it really likes the powders that it really likes this could be a pretty awesome shooting rifle man that is good stuff that is fantastic all right so let's get packed up get back to the bench Okay, so let's take a look at our fired brass. And you'll notice I took the primers out of one of each of the loads because I want to pull out our primer pocket checker here in just a second and see what sort of shape these primer pockets are in. Let's see if I can get my camera settings a little bit better to actually show you what's going on here. Some of the brass is a little bit beat up. Uh, no, nothing crazy. There's one of the case heads. Like, uh, nothing terrible. Still getting my case mouths dinged up. But I don't think the hand loads were hitting the brass deflector as hard as the factory ammo was. And you'll notice the two kind of streaks there. That's from the barrel extension. So I don't know if the barrel extension is where I'm getting the dent or if it's on the brass deflector. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, I think I need to just put something soft on the brass deflector to maybe help out a bit there. Maybe a little bit of gas system adjustment, that sort of stuff. We'll clean that up, but it's nothing I'm gonna obsess over because th those sorts of flaws iron out pretty easily. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like I had mentioned on the range. I had a feeling we would get inside and I really wouldn't be able to show you some of the shiny spot. There you go, there, there's one kind of kind of right there. No, nothing nothing really going on here. We're just picking nits, right? All right, now this is what I'm worried about, or I'm nervous about. Let's grab our swage gauge and just see what we can do. So that's the no-go side, right? Remember, the, the go side should go in, no problem, and the no-go side should not. Not even close. Nope. Definitely not. Nope. Nope. Yeah, that's six good ones. There's number seven. That one probably comes closest. Like I can kind of get it to barely go down in there like we were showing a little bit earlier. But yeah, that's that's not anything to freak out about yet. And there's the eighth one it is looking good. That is excellent news. All right, so it's finally time to wrap this godforsaken video up. I never meant for it to be this long, but I'm out of practice, man. It's been a while since I've made a video and I just couldn't stop talking. I'm coming out of this very happy and very optimistic. Clearly our, our Odin Works barrel will shoot a group. So that's really good news. You know, I feel like the upper is kind of proven at this point. We found two powders worthy of more investigation. I thought it was interesting that, so Varmint was clearly the better powder with the two lighter bullets. Well, and I guess it was also a little bit better with the 107 Sierra Match King, but with the 108 grain ELD match, you know, CFE 223 shot our best group of the day, our best velocity numbers of the day, as far as standard deviation and extreme spread. So feeling pretty good about both powders. I'm not particularly upset with any of the bullets, although we had the best groups with the 108 ELD match and the 105 Botel hollow point. I'm sure, you know, the next couple powders we test, it might just be the other way around. I don't know, none of them were terrible. 
So 10 shots in, I'm not ready to make any judgments there. So I think that's pretty much it. Like I said, we're gonna get into more discussion about determining max overall length with these bullets in the next video. Like I just was, it was a mess in this one and I've never had problems this bad. So we'll get it figured out eventually, but yeah, my efforts today were just a mess. I should have my Hornady dies for the next video and also my brass back order was finally filled. So I've got some brand new Hornady brass coming, although not in a big rush with it. I mean, I wanna go ahead and shoot these first pieces until, you know, either they fail or we get up to a number of firings where they're starting to get a little bit raggedy. I'm sure somewhere along the way as we, you know, try different powders and get a little bit stupid, we're gonna end up tearing up some brass just going over pressure and being idiots but hopefully it's going to be reasonably durable. All right, so that's it. I'll be starting the next video pretty much immediately. I might wait a couple days for, like I said, those, those dies to come in and that sort of stuff, but the wait shouldn't be long. So I appreciate you guys joining me. Thank you very much to the people who put up with the length and made it here to the end. And that's it. I'll see you guys next time.